Hey everybody, thank you so much for joining us online today. My name is Pastor Dana. I'm the pastor at Emmanuel Fruitland, and I have a few announcements for you today before we get started. Hey, if you have not already liked us on our church Facebook page, make sure you do that, and also our church Instagram, and download the church app if you haven't already done so, Emmanuel Wesleyan. Uh, it's our church app, and it's an awesome resource for many of you to stay connected. Um, we are having prayer nights um, every Wednesday night, we'll do a live Facebook time at 6.30. So if you have any prayer requests, ways that we can pray for you, make sure you join us live on Wednesday nights at 6.30 and let us know how we can pray for you. Hey, happy Easter today. We're doing our Easter service right now as you join in live. And then we will also be on again at 5 p.m. tonight. So make sure that you get the word out. And after you watch today's service, please do us a favor and share this and like it so that we can get the message out to other people who need it at this time of need. Also, you are doing a great job. Many of you are, are sending in your tithes and offerings. And you're going online. We, we thank you from the bottom of our hearts for this. And if you want to know how you can give if you've not already done so, we're giving you several different options. One being you can go online at either website. You can go on our Fruitland website. And um, you can go right on there and give online. Or if you go to our main campus website, just make sure you hit the Fruitland tab. And you can give online through the website. Also, the app, if you go on the app down on the bottom right side, you'll see the Fruitland page. If you hit that button, you can also go online and, and send your ties in that way. Many of you are also sending them through the mail at our church in Fruitland at 620 West Main Street in Fruitland. And we say thank you so much for keeping the ministry going in such a time as this. We appreciate all your support. Hey, it is Easter Sunday, and when I was little, every single Easter, my parents would come running into the bedroom, and they would say, he's risen, he's risen, he's risen. So I say to you today, he is risen, he is risen, he is risen. We know that this Easter is a different kind of Easter. We are not in the actual church, but again, we are the church. And so we're going to celebrate today the fact that he is risen right there in your home with us We've been looking through the book of Mark and all the different miracles that have taken place. And today I'm also going to be in Mark, actually going to be in a lot of different places, so bear with me today. We're going to be looking at um, Mark chapter 14 and 15. But before I get there, I want to tell you the name uh, of my message today is Come Back From Your Setbacks. Come Back From Your Setbacks. So I'll be looking at Mark chapter 14, verse 50. Mark chapter 14, verse 32 through 34, and Mark chapter 15, verse 33 and 34. I told you I'd be all over the place today. Let's start with Mark chapter 14, verse 50. It says this, Then everyone deserted him and fled. Mark chapter 14, verse 32 through 34 says this, They went to a place called Gethsemane, and Jesus said to his disciples, Sit here while I pray. He took Peter, James, and John along with him, and he began to be deeply distressed and troubled. My soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death, he said to them. Stay here and keep watch. Then we see in Mark chapter 15, verse 33 through 34, it says this, At noon darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon. And at three in the afternoon, Jesus called out in a loud voice, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Let's pray. Father God, I thank you so much today that we can celebrate the fact, God, that you are no longer on that cross, nailed to the cross. But God, you have overcome the cross. God, in fact, you have overcome the grave. We thank you, Lord, for who you are. I thank you, God, that today on this Easter Sunday, Lord, we can celebrate the fact that you have risen right, right in our living rooms, right in our own homes, or riding down in our car, God, even today, that we can call on your name, the name of Jesus. God, I thank you that you are still a miracle working, God. I thank you, God, for all that you're doing. I thank you for how you're, you're touching people's lives, God, and how you're moving and working behind the scenes. And we ask today, Lord, that someone would find you as their personal Savior. I pray, Lord, that you would go in every home now as this message is delivered. God, I pray that the power of your presence would be strong. In Jesus' name, and everybody said, amen. Amen. Do I have any golf lovers 
in, in, in the house, I would say in this house, but in your house. Are, are there any, any golf lovers around? Because I, I tell you what, I have two golf lovers in my house, my husband and my son, and they love them some golf. And, and you golf people crack me up. Like as soon as the weather gets just a little bit nice, Y'all start pulling out your golf shirts, your golf hats. You know, you got the cool clubs, the cool gloves. You, you got it all as you go out. And, and I know what happens every time that the weather is nice out because I can't find my husband or my son at home. They are nowhere to be found. They are on a golf course somewhere playing golf. In fact, it got so bad last summer, I felt like I hadn't seen them in so long. I said, look, you, what is the deal? <laughs> said, you playing golf again? They said, yeah, but I'll tell you what you need to do. You need to actually learn how to play golf and come with us so you can experience the true sport that it is. I said, okay, you know what? I'll go with you. They said, look, if you don't like it, you can just sit in the cart, and, and, and it's going to be an awesome time. I said, okay. So I load up. We go out to the golf course. I'm looking at the beauty of the golf course. I mean, it's absolutely gorgeous. On the water, we're sitting in the cart, and I'm talking to them. We're having a good time. They go to tee off. We, we go to a couple different holes. I'm still sitting in the same golf cart off to the side while they're up at the, at the hole getting ready to swing. And, and, and I'm sitting there, and I thought, you know what? This is stupid. I'm not going to sit in this golf cart by myself, bored to death. I'm going to get up and I'm going to go talk to them because it is quiet and it's dead and I don't like it. I like to talk and I want to get these boys hyped up. So I get out of the cart. I walk over to the hole and right when my husband's getting ready to hit the ball, I'm like, hey, honey, what's up? Come on, let's get fired up. And he looked at me and he says, rule number one, Dana, on the golf course. I said, what's that? He said, you've got to be quiet. You're not supposed to be talking talking, especially when someone's about to hit the ball. I said, well, I'll tell you right now, I might as well get in my car and go home because if I can't talk, there's going to be a problem because you know how much I love to talk. He said, oh, yes, I do. And I said, well, I can't tell you. He said, not when we're hitting the ball. I said, no problem. So I went back to the cart and I was mumbling a few words under my breath like this sport is absolutely ridiculous. I don't understand why I can yell at baseball and I can scream at the top of my lungs. But I come out here, they're still hitting the ball, but yet I have to be quiet. I'm sitting in the cart. We go to like three more holes from there. And I get out of the car and you know, I'm just, in fact, I'll just sit back in this car. I'll turn my music on my phone because I love the 80s. And when I'm bored or if I'm feeling low, I just turn the 80s on and it's all good. So I get my phone out. I'm turning on the 80s music. I'm like singing into my phone and I'm dancing in the car, minding my own business, trying not to distract anybody. And I see my son giving me the look, mom, turn your phone off. Like, don't you get it? Like, we're supposed to be quiet. We're playing golf. I said, look, I'm telling you again, I don't do good with being quiet. I don't like it, and I'm not doing good in this particular moment. He said, well, there's only one choice left. I said, what's that? He said, you need to get out of the cart, and you need to put a golf club in your hand, and we're going to teach you how to play golf. I said, okay, how hard can this be? Let's do it. He gives me a golf club. He said, I want you to see, and we want to see how you swing. Let's, let's just check it out. Why don't you try to hit this ball right here? So they place the ball in front of me. I take the golf club. I go swing, and I'm looking in the air trying to find the ball. And I'm saying to them, have you seen it? Where did it go? Man, I must have really hit it off far away. And they said, no, 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 it's still right here on the ground. I had never even hit the ball. Even though I felt like my swing was nice, I never even made contact with the ball. They said, if you just give us a minute, we would like to show you how to hold your club. I said, okay. So they come across, and they come on both sides of me, and they said, now we want to tell you how important it is to hold the club the right way. And I said, what do you mean? You mean grip it hard? They said, oh, no, no, no. Everything's about the grip. If you don't have a good grip, you're not going to have a good swing. I said, you're right. They said, no, no, seriously. You can't hold it too tight, and you can't have it too loose. you got to have it just right. So they're taking my hands, and they're showing me how to hold the golf club. And then they said, the next thing you need to do is loosen up a little bit. I said, do what? They said, bounce your knees up and down a little bit, relax them real good. And they said, and it's all in your hips, so you're going to have to swing your hips 
and use them as much as possible. I said, okay, so I, I put my hands like they said. I put my knees like they told me to do, and I went to swing. And I noticed that this time I actually hit the ball. Now, it was, it, was, it was hooking a little bit. It was curving, but they said, you know what? Again, if you get your grip straight, Mom, my son said, then your swing is going to look fantastic. But you got to keep practicing that grip and make sure those knees are just right. I said, okay. And as I'm talking to them, I'm asking them questions about why the grip is so important. And, and my son says, Mom, all the famous golfers, they all have a good swing because they got their grip down. And I said, what do you mean all the famous guys? He said, well, all kinds of guys. I said, you mean like Tiger Woods? Yep, Tiger Woods. I said, what about that guy? What was his name from years ago? Ben Hogan? Like I've heard something about a Ben Hogan. He said, oh, yeah, Mom. He was known for his swing. He had like the best swing ever. So I went to do research on Ben Hogan and found that sure enough, Ben used to hook the ball. Everywhere, every time he would swing the ball, he would hook it. So he spent a lot of time and had this particular theory of how he would grip the ball. And not only that, is how he would stand and how he would go back with the swing and how he would just do everything just right. He had a theory behind it all so that he would have the best swing. And I'm going to tell you something. The more I researched that, that guy named Ben, I'm going to call him Benny Boy. The more I researched Benny Boy, I realized that man was awesome. So early in his career. I'm talking about like the 1940s. My boy was tearing it up. Listen to this. He had won 53 PGA Tour victories. 53. Until a major setback. On February the 2nd, 1949, him and his wife were going for a ride one morning and little did they know what was about to happen. They had a terrible automobile accident where they hit a Greyhound bus head on, a head on collision. Benny Boy decided that he, right before the collision happened, was going to take his body and lay it across his wife to protect her. Now, the more I read, the more it stated that it's a good thing he did that because the steering wheel column had actually punctured through the, the driver's seat of the car. So he would have been dead if he had stayed in that position. But instead, he was trying to protect his wife. And as he did that, he still lived, but he had all kinds of fractures. I'm talking pelvis, ankle, collarbone, you name it. And even on top of all the fractures that he suffered, he had a severe blood clot. And the doctors told him, they said, hey, Benny boy, I, wanna, I want you to know that, you know, you, you're never going to play golf again. In fact, you're not even going to walk again. Like this, this is something that is going to set you down for life. You're not going to be able to do anything. Well, you know what I love about the story so much, I think that touches me, is Ben had a decision to make that day. He could have sat there in his setback and listened to the doctors and said, you know what, you're right. It's just something I'm going to have to live with. This is just pain that I'm going to have to endure. I'm just going to have to get used to it. I'll never amount to anything. But he didn't do that. He proved them wrong, and he came back even stronger than that. He made a comeback from his setback. This is what happened after he got back to not only having the strength to walk, but my boy came back in the game of golf better than before. He comes back with this. He had 31 wins after his accident, additional 20 trophies, increasing his number of tour victories to 84, including 11 majors, two more than his actual number of nine that he had before the accident. I mean, he came back on top. Even though he had experienced great pain and great setback, Ben didn't stay there. Ben came back and he overcame all of it. I want to talk to someone today who feels like you're sitting in a major setback right this very moment. You've experienced so much pain that you can pretty much identify with what Ben was going through. Maybe you haven't been in a car accident, but you can identify with the pain that he was feeling in that exact moment when the doctor said, you're done. Your career's done. You can never walk. Maybe someone's told you today that you're done. Or maybe you feel so down and discouraged and you're experiencing so much pain that you can't move. You're overwhelmed today. I want you to know that there is one 
that can live in us and through us. There is one that has overcome all of it, and his name is Jesus. And I know that we can get through the setbacks, and I know that we can get through the pain, and we can come on top. You know why I know that? Because Jesus tells us in John 16, he says, Take heart, for I have overcome the world. He's already made the final comeback so we can experience any setback in our life knowing that not only has Ben gone through it, but Jesus has gone through it. He's gone through pain, he's gone through setbacks, but he ends up coming back on top. That's who Jesus is. I want to look at different setbacks that Jesus experienced, and I'm sure you can identify with many of them today. The first one I want to look at is relational setbacks. Relational setbacks. I'm going to look right there for a minute. If you, um, when you were little, I don't know what it was like in your school, but when I was in like second or third grade, we had this thing going where everyone would make these really cool notes and we would pass it during class to someone else. And we would fold it a, a certain way. In fact, I tried to remember how I folded it back in the day, but I didn't have much love, but I, was, I knew exactly how to do it in school. And I would fold it up and I would put, please answer me, yes or no, circle one. And we would pass it to our friends, and then they would pass it back to us. And this particular day, I had a, a crush on a boy that was in my class, and I couldn't wait to send this note because I had a feeling that he liked me back. And so I thought, cool, I'll send him this note. I'll pass it in class. He can circle yes or no, and then life will go on from there. So I finally get enough nerve to send this note through the classroom, hoping that the teacher would not catch it. I pass it up behind the person behind me. They pass it up and they pass it and they pass it. And I see that he gets it. And I sit there and my heart is beating. I'm so nervous. I thought, well, here it goes. Here's nothing. I get the note back. And it did not say yes that he liked me back. It said no. And not only did he circle the no, but he said, I actually like so-and-so. Well, that so-and-so was one of my best friends. It was at that moment where I was experiencing a relational setback. I was so bummed out, y'all, that he would like my best friend over me. It hurt so bad that I'd rather just not have said anything at all. I was going through a relational setback. Jesus knew all about relational setbacks. In fact, he had 12 people, 12 boys, his boys, that he handpicked in the early parts of his ministry to go be with him. These weren't the kind of friends and kind of gatherings that you would get together every once in a while to have a cup of coffee. I mean, these boys did life with him. They knew everything about Jesus. They were with him day in and day out. They knew all the miracles that he had performed. They knew the insides and outs of Jesus. They knew everything about him. And so he's hanging out with them. These were his boys. They're eating supper. You know, he, they are grubbing. They are grubbing. They're eating supper. I, I would imagine they were probably eating some kind of bread because, my God, that's what I could go for right now. Like, I can't wait for Texas Roadhouse to open back up. So I can see them maybe eating some Texas Roadhouse bread, sitting around talking. I mean, these were Jesus' boys. These were his peeps. He's hanging out. He's, he's eating supper with them, and he tells them, he says, look, I'm about to be arrested, and when I'm arrested, y'all are going to betray me. And they looked at him like, what are you talking about, Jesus? Like, you crazy. We are not about to leave you high and dry. Like, we would never do that to you, Jesus. We are your boys. Like, what don't you get? We have your back. No matter what you go through, we are here for you, Jesus. Until that soldier came up on the scene with his big sword and his big torches, and the soldiers come to get Jesus to arrest him, and then all of a sudden, those bad boys were gone, disappeared. Mark 14, verse 50 says, everyone deserted him and fled. Can you imagine being Jesus at that moment, having his boys at the most time that he needed them the most to just simply peace out and walk away from him in that moment. Can you imagine how betrayed he felt? Can you imagine how alone he felt? Maybe you can. Maybe you can't imagine what I'm talking about because you too have experienced that in your life. Or maybe you're even experiencing it today. Maybe that's the kind of setback that you're experiencing where you're dealing with a, a person in your life that you thought would be there for life. You thought they had your back no matter what, only to find in the times where you needed the most, they have left you high and dry. 
Maybe it's a, a spouse or an ex-spouse, a parent or even a friend, a family member who you thought, that's my family. Like, they're going to be there for me. Like, we, we, we can get grumpy with each other. Like, we can kid with each other. We can, like, we can do whatever. We can grab them on the head lot, you know what I'm saying? We can do whatever. It's like we're family. Like, we, we stay together no matter what, only to find that something happens in your life. And all of a sudden, the ones that you thought loved you the most have left. That's how Jesus felt at this moment. And if we're not careful, the anger and the guilt and the disappointment that we feel in that moment, if that is not dealt with, it can turn to bitterness and it can cause more setbacks. But you know what I know is that even in the middle of feeling totally defeated and betrayed by someone, I know that we can overcome it again. How do I know? Because John 16, tells me, and Jesus tells me there, he says, take heart for I have overcome the world. If Jesus has overcome this, if Jesus can come back after resurrection and find these bad boys, his boys, and still love them, then maybe that's what we need to do too we need to realize that these setbacks we don't have to stay in them we don't have to stay in the hurt we don't have to stay betrayed but in fact we can come back even stronger relational setbacks the next one I want to talk about is emotional setbacks have you ever met somebody that is completely emotional like you'll just be talking to them and all of a sudden they're just like <laughs> I'm sorry I'm just I don't know what's wrong with me like I'm just so emotional today like I don't know if you've ever experienced that, but I have just been talking to someone. They just bust out crying. I'm like, here's your hanky, like what, whatever, like get a hold of yourself, you know. I, I can laugh about all I want today, but I know that sometimes this girl right here, when it comes to movies, I can get emotional. Like the other day when I'm watching Creed 2, I love Rocky movies. I couldn't wait to watch Creed 2. I go watch Creed 2, and I'm all good through the whole thing until... Apollo Creed's son and his wife have a child, and then they discover that that child is deaf, right? I, I, I was just getting a little misty-eyed. I said, you know, my kids kept looking at me. I said, I got this, I got this. I worked my way through it until the end of the movie. After the big fight, after everything was good, they experienced a victory. They're coming back to the house. Well, Rocky leaves Apollo Creed's son. He's like, I, you know, I knew you could do it. They say their goodbyes. He goes back, and he finds his son, his son who he has not talked to in years. He decides that this particular day he's going to go make a relationship and get things right with his son. And he goes up, knocks on the door, and his son comes to the door. But before he comes to the door, his, what he didn't know at the time, grandson opens the door. And he says, Dad, someone's here for you. And when his son, Rocky's son, walked to the door, he says, um, Actually, he looks at his son, he says, son, that, that's your grandfather. And Rocky meets his grandson at that very moment, and the look on his face, not only did his son open the door and ask him to come in, but he meets his grandson for the very first time. And what got me right here is I was getting real, real, real emotional at this point, but then when he says, you know what, you look like someone that I, I once knew. Her name was Adrian. And this child looked completely like Rocky's wife that he had lost Looked just like his grandmother at that time. And you're talking about emotional. I'm like bawling my eyes and I'm like, somebody get me a hanky right now. Like, I, I mean, I couldn't pull myself together. My kids looked at me like, come on, mom, it's just a movie. But movie or not, I was emotional at that moment. And you know what? Jesus knows what it's like to be emotional. Jesus also cried. Jesus was emotional. We see that he's emotional in Mark chapter 14, verse 32 through 34. We see right before Jesus gets arrested, he's taken, taken to a place called Gethsemane. So he's there and Jesus said to his disciples, sit here while I pray. And then he took Peter, James, and John along with him and he began to deeply distress. Watch that word. Deeply distressed and, and he was troubled. And he says, my soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. My soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Now, I don't know about you, but I interpret that Dana style into my man Jesus, he was crying, y'all. He, he was emotional. He was experiencing a setback, and he 
was very emotional. He is expressing himself to Peter, James, and John who were there at that moment. And that's what I, I love about Jesus is in this moment, he wasn't afraid to express how he felt. He, he wasn't afraid to, to show emotion, to let his disciples that were there know, hey, look, I'm sad. Like, I'm experiencing so much emotion right now that I am almost feel like to the point of death. Like, that's how much I am hurting right, right now. I mean, he, he shows that to them, and he doesn't, I don't, I don't know about you, I don't know how you've ever felt so overwhelmed before, but if we're not careful, oftentimes when we feel so overwhelmed with sorrow, we can hold that in and not express that to anybody because we may feel weak or we feel like we're not supposed to do that. So we hold it in, but, but in fact, I feel like some people have, are sitting in their hurt from some time ago, and we're still sitting in our setbacks. We've never, ever dealt with them. We've not expressed to other people how we felt. We've not expressed to Jesus how we felt and we're sitting in it and God cannot do what he wants to do in our life if we're still sitting in a hurt he we're going to miss out on everything that God has for us and that's what I love about Jesus is that he didn't sit there he could have sat there and say you know I just you know, I, just, I mean he could have just sat in that moment and never did anything. He knew what was about to happen. He knew that a crucifixion was in store for him down the road. He knew this, but yet he expressed his emotions at that moment. He was experiencing an emotional setback. I don't know if you've been there before, but in the middle of it, we need to make sure that we know that Jesus understands any kind of emotional setback that we've ever been through or ever going to experience. And the third setback that Jesus experienced is spiritual setbacks. Have you ever been at a particular time in your walk with Christ where you felt like Jesus has deserted you? Like he, like you're talking to him, you're going through a situation, you're like, but I just need to hear from Jesus. Like I just need to get in his presence. I need to know that he's there. I need him to talk to me, walk with me, something. And you're sitting in those places where you don't hear anything and you often, often wonder, Jesus, are you there? Are you there? Why are you not talking to me, Jesus? Why are you not commuting? Why? Just give me something. It's the dark Moments of our life where we feel like we need Jesus the most. Jesus experienced spiritual setbacks. He knew what it was like to go through a dark moment. You see, Jesus was put on trial. And the Bible tells us that Pilate, the Roman official who ultimately convicted him, he finally releases Barnabas and, and, and to the people, and then he had Jesus flogged. Now, I want, I want to stop there, and I picked this particular translation and verse because I wanted to just zoom in on flog for a minute because that really grabbed my attention. I thought, you know, I bet a lot of people don't know what that is or what that means. It basically is when a person's hands are tied, in this particular case, Jesus, to a pole to the top and his back would be completely exposed. And his hands are tied so tight at the top that the skin was tight as possible. He was beaten with a piece of wood with nine straps of leather intertwined together where there's pieces of bone and glass and rock. And when they would whip and hit anybody, including Jesus, this particular case, Jesus, when they went to whip him, these rocks and stone and glass would, would engage in his skin. And when they went to pull the whip back, parts of Jesus' skin would come right out on the whip and they continued to do that. In fact, most people never ever overcame being flogged, but Jesus in this particular moment, he's being flogged, he's being beaten to death. He's, he's on this cross, he's naked, he's out there where the whole world can see what is happening. And in Mark chapter 15, verse 33 and 34 tells us, it said, noon darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon. And at three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? I went back and looked at that scripture again. I said, hold up, from noon to three? Well, from noon to three in the afternoon, that's, that's when it's the nicest out, like that's when it's the brightest out. In this particular verse, 
refers to the darkness that is felt then. I wonder if someone can identify today the times in your life right now that should be bright, your brightest days, your brightest moments somehow have turned out dark for you. Jesus can identify. It was this moment where he was having a dark moment. He was wanting his father. His father was nowhere to be found. He was abandoned. You know what I'm talking about. He, he was in a moment where he was looking for his father. His father was not even there. He was going through a spiritual setback. He was abandoned. He was left to die. But I'm glad that Jesus overcame death so that when we feel like we are abandoned or we are alone, we can know that Jesus understands how you are feeling because he's been there and felt the same thing. But I know one thing, you can come back from your setbacks. Jesus is in this dark place. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Jesus, many of you know the story, he eventually passes away. They take his body and place it in the tomb. And then I, wanna, I went and I looked back in Matthew, Matthew 28, verse 1 and 2. I, I don't have that displayed for you today, but I just want to refer to it. Matthew 28, it says this, says that the day after the Sabbath when things were quiet, old Mary Magdalene and the other Mary, I call them Eminem, Eminem went to the tomb, right? They, they go to the tomb to see what is going to see if Jesus is really there. And they wanted to see his body. And there had been an earthquake at that moment, and the angel of the Lord appeared. And the angel comes down, rolls back the stone, and check this out. This is the best part of, of Matthew chapter 28. The angel comes, rolls back the stone, and guess what the angel does? The angel sits on it. Now, I know you know that all throughout the Bible, we see angels everywhere. We see that angels on a particular assignment, angels are sent to tell people different things. But in this particular time, like this angel, this angel had the coolest job ever. Like this angel was not only rolling the stone away, but this angel was sitting on the stone away from the tomb. This angel's like, hold up, look now. I got front row seat on the best thing that's about to happen. Like, I get to sit here and watch the resurrection take place. Like, this is about to be totally cool. So he's sitting there, roll the stone away. Eminem are coming up on the scene. Resurrection's taking place. His appearance was like lightning. His clothes were like snow. And in that very moment, the guards were afraid. They were petrified. They're like, what's going on? And, and the angel looks at m and and, and and he's like, do not be afraid. We know that you're here to see Jesus, but guess what? Jesus is not here. He's risen. He's risen just as he said. I wonder how many of you are stuck home today and you're feeling so afraid right now. I want you to know that, that you don't have to fear anymore. You, you don't have to live in the situation where you experience so many setbacks and so much pain. You don't have to stay there. You know why? Because of this. The resurrection became the reason that we can have hope today. Jesus has never abandoned anything, honey, except for the grave. That's what he has abandoned. He is alive today. And guess what? He's right in the middle of your setback with you. And he's saying, look, honey, you don't have to sit in this setback, but you can come back from your setbacks. You can make the greatest comeback. And that's what I love about Jesus. My boy knew how to come back. I don't know what kind of pain you're experiencing. I don't know what kind of hurt you've experienced. I don't know what kind of disappointment and betrayal that you are feeling right now. You probably are at home and you feel like no one is called, no one cares. But guess what? There is one who cares and his name is Jesus. And guess what? He has overcome the grave. He lives and he's inside of you right now. He knows everything that you're doing. He knows every thought that you're experiencing. And he's saying this. He's saying, hey, don't sit in your setbacks anymore for I have overcome this world and because of me you can overcome any kind of setback that you're experiencing today I don't know about you but that gives me a lot of hope that when I'm having a bad time or going through the middle of a setback that Jesus is there that I can come back from any setbacks that are in my life for those of you who feel afraid those of you who feel overwhelmed Know that in Christ, we too can overcome. He's setting you up 
to come back from whatever you're facing today. So on this Easter, I want you to know that you are not alone. I want you to know that Jesus understands exactly how you are feeling in this very moment. And because of Jesus, we can overcome and come back from any kind of setups and setbacks that we experience in life. Will you bow your head with me today? Lord, I I thank you, God, for the fact, Lord, that you didn't stop by just simply dying on the cross. Like, your story does not stop there. Lord, I'm grateful that three days later, God, you proved us wrong. I'm glad that three days later, God, you, you came out of that grave. You overcame the grave, God. I thank you for that today. And Lord, I pray that today that would give somebody at home some hope today. Hope that it's going to be okay. Hope that you're going to get through the pain. Hope that you're going to get through the setback. And know, God, that you have overcome death. So they don't have to be alone in the middle of their pain today. Father, I pray for that person that's never known you as their Savior, and I pray that today they would just simply repent of all their sins and say, hey, Jesus, I'm sorry for all the stupid things that I've done, and I want you to come into my life this very moment, Jesus, and change me from the inside out. God, I want to live for you from this moment on. God, I pray for every person who prayed that prayer right now or is thinking about that prayer right now. God, I pray that today on this Resurrection Sunday, God, you would resurrect any dead problems, any dead pain that is in their life, and God, you would make someone whole again. I thank you for who you are and the hope that we have in you. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you so much for joining us today online. Make sure that you share this message so we can get it out to other people who may be experiencing some setbacks as well. Happy Easter, and remember, he has risen.